Oh, boy, yeah, we drove a long way, and apologies for that, uh, but uh, thank God I lowered the gas tax, because we spent a lot of gas. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's great to be here, uh, and uh, you know, Steve, those are very, very kind words, and uh, you know, Steve has shown incredible leadership day in, day out. You know, uh, I'll just say, uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm the son of two Hungarian immigrants, uh, one who came during World War II as a 10-year-old, 1944, my mother came, and uh, her, uh, her brother and her parents, they were separated, re reunited three years later, didn't know if they were alive or not. And three, uh, so I met my grandparents and my mother and my br uh, her brother and uh, three great grandparents, and they all lived in one room, a roof in one ho not one house under one roof, and you know that's the dream. Whether you're born here or you came to this country, that you can have a roof over your head, that you can raise your family, that you can get a good job, that you can get your kids educated, so that they can uh, then rise to be the minister of finance and the leadership of Steve Clark to help build this province so that dream of home ownership can exist again for everybody in this province. I want to thank you, Stephen, for that. So I'm very pleased to be here in North Grenville, and I did come off the, the highway there, and I saw the, the signs for Kempville, and of course, Kempville, I am a bit of a history buff, and I schooled Steve Pakin on this uh, in, the, in an interview a few weeks ago. I said, do you know who's the last premier to win a bigger majority with the same size legislature in the history of, of, of uh, the province. Of course, they, they say, said Bill Davis or John Robarts or it's got to be Mike Harris. Well, a, big, a majority back to back, but not a bigger one. The last premier to do that was Howard Ferguson in 1929 from Kempville, Ontario. The last premier to win a bigger majority. Until, of course, Doug Ford. So, uh, so in, in the challenge with that, now he has to manage a bigger caucus, but that's a nice problem to have. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, it's a real honor to be here, and when Steve asked me to come, uh, I was thrilled to do it, and I said, should I speak in the morning or should I speak in the afternoon? He said, pick the morning. So here I am, and I'm glad, glad you did suggest that, Steve. Um, I, I do want to talk about the progress that we've made in our plan to build, which Steve um, highlighted uh, up here at the podium, the fall economic statement that I tabled Monday. And I did 24 TV interviews and radio interviews and ended with Steve Pakin the other day. That was on, uh, on Wednesday night. And it has gone extremely well. I, I've gotten a great reception uh, uh, in my travels in, in this past week, including yesterday morning standing with the Minister of Labor, Monty McNaughton, and a bunch of unions. You know, we, we have developed such a strong partnership with many private sector unions across the province. And the reason, and you know, people have said eight private sector unions endorsed our party in the election, and that's, that's unheard of. But the reason is very simple. We all have the same goals, to have good jobs, bigger paychecks, be able to raise a family, to work in this province, and help build this province. And so we were very proud to, to, uh, to stand with the union yesterday as we announced a $40 million addition to the Skills Development Fund. And what is the Skills Development Fund? It's helped retrain almost 400,000 people in the few years that we've had that program uh, for the, the jobs of tomorrow. So the skilled trades, a number of skilled trades, the, the healthcare workers, a whole range of jobs. Uh, sometimes uh, you go down one path and the market goes a different way. But to, to be able to retrain 400,000 people in just a couple of years is remarkable. And they're standing shoulder to shoulder with us. Now, I do want to share with you as well some targeted measures we are pro uh, proposing in the face of these economic and fiscal challenges we are seeing around the globe. And uh, these truly are uncertain economic times. And uh, Steve and I are uh, from a certain vintage um, where we he saw interest rates and inflation this high 40 years ago. And that's, that, for many people, is a brand new uh, risk and, and challenge to, to deal with. Um, la conjoncture économique est incertaine. En 2022, l'indice des prix à la consommation de l'Ontario a atteint un sommet inégalé depuis de, uh, près de 40 ans. And we're suffering from high inflation because of the consequences of a worldwide pandemic that we've just gone through, Russia's illegal war uh, on Ukraine, which has caused supply disruptions around the world, and a, 
uh, affected many industries. And I'm, certainly, I'm certain that I don't need to tell you that here at home uh, that uh, the cost of groceries and every, uh, uh, every, everyday goods continues to be stubbornly high, whether you're paying rent or your mortgage has gone up or uh, the various components that go into the price of everything. And the months ahead are likely to be marked by um, ongoing economic turbulence and a slowdown in growth. This is why our government has a responsible fiscal plan uh, and it will help us navigate through these uncertain times. So let me tell you a little bit about that plan. First off, to build Ontario's economy, we're making a real good progress in attracting investments and good jobs. Over the last two years, we have attracted more than $12.5 billion in transformative global automotive investments of electric vehicles and EV battery manufacturing plants. And we've attracted $2.5 billion in investments so that will help make the province a world leading producer of clean steel. So converting the steel plants in Hamilton, the DeFasco steel plant from coal to electricity, the one in uh, Sault Ste. Marie that's owned by Algoma from coal to electricity. And by the way, our electricity grid is 94% zero carbon emission. That's through hydro, through nuclear, through re renewable. So we have one of the cleanest grids in all of North America, in fact, the world. And that's what, in part, attracting a lot of companies that are coming to Ontario because they are using the energy that's clean uh, to drive the economy and deal with climate change. In addition to that, we have to build our workforce. We're making progress in training uh, students and, and workers to succeed, as I said, today and tomorrow. I mentioned the, uh, the Skills Development Fund as just one example. Almost 400,000 people re-skilled, retrained for, for the jobs that are in demand. We've added uh, already 11,700 healthcare workers, including nurses and personal support workers since the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, and we've added them to our health care system. To build infrastructure for, to, uh, for Ontario, we're making progress by getting shovels in the ground on critical projects right across the province, including early works on the land acquisitions to facilitate, uh, to facilitate future widening of Highway 401 through, wait for it, Brockville. <laughs> and that's in lo no large measure through uh, Steve Clark's advocacy as, as the MPP for the riding and, and also a great uh, voice and advocate for the region. We've also invested over $950 million in nearly 190 broadband, cellular and satellite projects, bringing access to over 300, 375,000 homes and businesses. And that was important to me. I put that in the budget uh, about two years ago to say, we got to connect everybody in this vast province. Um, and there are, there are almost 750,000 underserved or not served at all homes and, and businesses across this province. And I said, not only do we need to connect the whole province, but we have to do it by 2025. And this is just another example of getting, thank you, getting it going. And we have a lot of work to do to keep costs down. Our government eliminated, um, I, I don't know if you have many subways here, but if you drive, <laughs> the, uh, the license plate renewal fees is $120 per vehicle, you know, to give people a break. And we refunded two years of past license fees to give people a break, given the high cost of living. And it's helping make life affordable for more than $8 million, uh, 8 million sorry, vehicle owners in Ontario. Uh, that's real, real money in their pockets. We have saved and continue to save money for Ontario households, as I mentioned, by temporarily, temporarily lowering the gas tax. And that we had done it from July 1st of this year to the end of December 31st. But I said to the Premier, you know, people are still hurting. You know, the cost of everything has gone up. We need to, we need to continue this. And uh, he's a big champion of that. So we're continuing the gas tax relief for another year starting January 1st. So it's going to be a year and a half. Um, to secure our long-term uh, prosperity, we must increase supply. We have that, what, and what does that mean? That means we need to build hospitals and housing and highways and roads and manufacturing capacity. And that is exactly what we're doing each and every day because it's important that we get things done. 
that we actually, it's one thing to be in gridlock or to see a building uh, in construction, but it's really important that we get it done. We get it on time, built on time. And we're also addressing, uh, advancing our plan with new targeted measures to rebuild the economy, address the labor shortages in the province, and keep costs down for all families and businesses. Nous présentons aussi notre plan pour mettre en œuvre de nouvelles mesures ciblées dans le but de reconstruire l'économie, combler les actuelles pénuries de main d'œuvre dans la province et garder les coûts bas pour les familles et les entreprises. This government, because of voices like Steve's and right across this province, understands Main Street Ontario matters. That's why we're proposing to increase the number of small businesses that could benefit from the small business tax rate. This change will lower costs for small businesses by providing $185 million in tax relief over the next three years. And our province is facing a, an historic labor shortage, so let me talk about that. There are over, you've probably heard the Premier and others talk about, there are over 387,000 jobs currently unfilled across the province. There's more jobs than people, and we recognize the incredible potential in each and every person in this province, everybody in this province. And that is why we are proposing to increase the amount a person on Ontario Disability Support Program, also known as ODSP, can earn from $200 to $1,000 per month without impacting any of their income, income supports. This measure would encourage people who want to increase their work hours to do so and promote more participation in the workforce. It would allow the approximately 25,000 individuals currently in the workforce to keep more of their earnings and could encourage as many as 25,000 more to participate in the workforce. And our government also recognizes that there are many ODSP recipients who cannot work and that they need our continued support. That is why in August we announced a 5% increase to ODSP rates. And going forward, we plan to adjust ODSP rates to inflation beginning in July of 2023. So when the cost of living increases, income support would increase as well. And you know, I, we made that announcement on Monday for the increased earnings exemption so they could keep more money in their pockets and not affect any of the benefits and the many disability associations, the Community Living of Toronto, the uh, Ability Centre, and other uh, disability organizations said, no government has done this in 20 years. They've been asking for 20 years, can you believe that? 20 years for this measure to be done. They said it's an absolute game changer. Many had tears in their eyes when they were talking to me. And that's one small reason that people like Steve and I and the mayor uh, for the second term, congratulations, uh, that we do public service. It's to help many who need our support. Every one of us in the room is here to support them, and I'm so proud to have made that announcement last Monday. We're also talking about skills training, and I mentioned it through the Skills Development Fund, and I mentioned the $40 million. That, that brings us to $145 million for the Skilled Trades Development Fund. It represents an opportunity for thousands of people to have a successful career in the trades, especially high school students. And that is why our government is expanding the dual credit program, creating direct pathways for high school students seeking a career in the trades or in early childhood education. This gives students the opportunity to complete credits towards an Ontario secondary diploma, school diploma or a college credential or a certificate of apprenticeship and begin work earlier. I met this woman at the press conference yesterday with Monty McNaught and Courtney, and she worked in a bar, and Courtney, um, uh, because of COVID, didn't have a job. And she went through the skills development uh, training program, and she's now a uh, pipe fitter, a steam uh, pipe fitter, large pipe, she explained to me. And uh, she has been doing it for a year and a half now, and she is unbelievably happy. And we need people like Courtney to work in the skilled trades because we're building right across the province. 
Now, at the same time, we know, as I said at the outset, that this is a challenging financial time for many in our province, and it is being felt by some of the most vulnerable in our province. I mentioned the uh, gas tax cut, which we've done. This will put $195 on average, on average, for every household in Ontario. But let me also talk about seniors. Seniors built this province. And we owe them all a debt of gratitude. I just attended five remembrance events and uh, meeting the veterans again uh, and thanking them again for their service and then to help build this province, this country. But for too many low-income seniors today, covering day-to-day -day costs has been a source of anxiety. Many are on fixed incomes. Many are hurting with higher inflation. And that's why I announced on Friday that our government is proposing to double payments for all senior recipients of the Ontario Guaranteed Annual Income System Program for 2023. This measure would provide a maximum increase of almost $1,000 per person for low-income seniors for the year, and that would impact up to 200,000 200, seniors, low-income seniors in this province. Now, our government is taking a targeted approach, and when faced with this degree of uncertainty, we need to be flexible and forward-thinking with a fiscal plan that is ready to support people and businesses when and if the time comes, while also laying the fiscal foundation for future generations. So after unprecedented spending in response to the pandemic, now is the time for governments to show broad restraint, to act cautiously and responsibly. Irresponsible spending today will only make inflation more painful and drag out the economic downturn. And I will say to you all today, the economic road ahead will not be easy. But I firmly believe there's nothing that we cannot do together, no challenge that we cannot meet, no obstacle that we cannot overcome. I'm very confident that whatever the economic uncertainty that is around, for all of us, we'll meet it head on. And rest assured, your government has a plan to get us through these challenging times together. Because I believe, believe fundamentally, because together we can get it done, we can build Ontario together. Thank you very much. Now, I'd be happy to take some questions if we have a, 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 some time. Absolutely. And uh, so do we have anyone in the audience who uh, has a question for the minister? I'm sure this is not a shy group. <laughs> Over here. Go ahead. Oh, I'll do. I was just um, wanting to break the ice and uh, then I happily bring the mic over uh, to my colleague, Mayor Jones. Um, I, I did want to recognize the significance of the changes to the Ontario Disability Benefits Program. It's really game-changing, I know, for so many low-income um, residents in Ontario uh, who have unfortunately found themselves on a disability program. So I just wanted to quickly ask, what, what was the you know, deliberation that led to that particular moment? Because uh, we know the benefits program has been fairly stagnant for a number of years now, and uh, certainly I think uh, these changes uh, will be very, very significant. So just wanted to thank you, but also uh, just sort of get a, get a better sense of your thinking on that. That's a great question, and thank you for that. Uh, you know, I got in politics. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, why did I get in politics? I, I did it. Uh, I, I worked in the financial sector my whole career, and but growing up as a as a young kid in Montreal, uh, and uh, being surrounded by three great grandparents who told me all their stories about the wars in Hungary and World War II, and and they risked life and limb uh, to come to a country where they could be free and 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 they could have democracy, and that. They didn't want any, they didn't want a handout. They, they wanted uh, just to live safely, to have a job, the roof over their heads. But, so I really fundamentally believed as a young kid that this was the greatest country on the planet. And I'm a little older now, and I still believe it, it's the greatest country on the planet. But that said, some people, you know, for whatever reason, life doesn't, isn't fair, or for whatever reason, they have challenges. And I also fundamentally believe that uh, we've got to help those who are most vulnerable. And it's a core value of mine. I know it's a core value of the Premier and it's a core value of our government. So while we support the economy and we want to grow jobs and we want to grow the economy and grow the pie, 
frankly, so that we can pay for world-class health care and social services and education, I believe fundamentally as part of our government's mandate is to, to look at all aspects of, of uh, the most vulnerable. And that's another reason, for example, not just the ODSP rates, and we'll continue to do things. Uh, there's a whole suite of programs that people on disability, meals, medicine, vision, dental care, uh, supportive housing. Um, it's a big reason why Steve Clark is leading, really, uh, nation building. Steve is doing a nation building job, and it's not easy some days uh, in that job so that people can have the dream of the home ownership. That's not just for a young family. That's for, as I said, people who, um, who uh, seniors who uh, want to go from a home to a more age-friendly home. It's for people on disabilities who need more accessible housing. It's for affordable housing. It's for a whole, all of society. And we can either talk about it in committee uh, and create another task force or have another hearing about it, or we can get, start getting the job done to build the housing right across the, uh, the province so that we can accommodate the 300,000 people and the people who are here who have the dream of owning or living in the property. So that was a long answer to a short question, but I think we got to think about it for everybody. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Go ahead. Sorry, you're already up. Oh, I'm already up, she says. All right. Thank you very much. I hope I don't take your question. <laughs> uh, Minister, thank you very much for being here. My name's Robin Jones. I'm the mayor of Westport, and I'm the chair of Roma. So you heard the round of applause. You may not have heard it for uh, Minister Clark and yourself when you talked about broadband, because, you know, that is an essential service, particularly in rural Ontario, which we found during COVID. Some of the other announcements you've made today have been long overdue and, and uh, we're, we're happy from my own municipality and Roma. So probably not a question, but something to leave you with. And Minister Clark made the same point about uh, the immigration and that uh, there was a reference to the Greater Toronto Horse and Hamilton area. We have jobs that need to be filled in rural Ontario. For rural Ontario, it's an issue of housing, employment and transportation. Because in my municipality, I may well have the jobs. Village of Westport has lots of jobs, but we don't have housing. And Minister Clark is doing a great job with that, but we need the people. So wherever the planning is for where these people are being um, offered opportunities, please don't leave out rural Ontario because we need people to fill our jobs. Well, that's a great, uh, great comment. If I can just build on that, and thank you for those comments, and thank you for your leadership, including uh, Roma. Um, you know, uh, many, one thing about COVID is many people wanted to move out of the cities, and uh, so in some respect, uh, areas like this are beneficiaries of that. But we're also going to bring in a lot of people, and we are bringing in a lot of people. And it's not just housing. Uh, housing is absolutely critical here for, for all of rural Ontario, all parts of Ontario, the north, every part of Ontario. Uh, but it's, you got to have the infrastructure. You know, we got to build those roads. We got to upgrade the roads. We got to make sure that the, um, that we've got the broadband, as you mentioned, that we got to make sure that, uh, all forms of transportation, you know, the, the widening of the 401 that we're, we're engaging in and making sure that we have the bridges. We doubled the Ontario community infrastructure fund. I did that. It was a billion dollars a year. Um, and we doubled it to $2 billion to support many rural communities, municipalities. So not only doubled it that you would have more funds for infrastructure, but we did it over five years, a billion extra a year for five years. So you'd have the certainty of the funds. And that I think is uh, helping almost 390 municipalities out of 440, uh, 390 more smaller municipalities, not the big ones. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue to have a mindset of all of Ontario. I'll, I'll maybe pivot up for a second to Northern Ontario. For the longest time, they've had the minerals, the critical minerals that have go into the electric vehicles and the battery manufacturing, they've got the minerals. And so instead of having to go to China or Russia to, to, to get those minerals, we have them right here in Northern Ontario, but there are no roads, there's no infrastructure. So we put a year ago on my budget, or fall economic statement, sorry, a year ago, a billion dollars to work with First Nations to get that road built. 
And I'm going up uh, after this to Ottawa to continue to implore them to put in their billion so we can get an infrastructure and a road to the road to prosperity for the north. So it's here in eastern Ontario, it's in rural Ontario, it's in northern Ontario, it's all of Ontario, and we are going to get it done. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Debbie Hutchings from Ward 4 of Reader Lakes. My question is, what do you have planned for the agriculture sector? Well, the agriculture, which is a terrific question, you know, we, we've done, uh, we've lot of, done a lot of funding uh, in, the, uh, in the agriculture sector, including increase the risk management program. We've uh, also put a lot of money under Lisa Thompson's leadership, the Minister of Agriculture, to, uh, to put more money into in innovation. Into, into the sector, our big grant programs for that, including processing, so we can uh, get more processing, processing capability within the, uh, within the province. Um, you know, under Todd Smith's leadership uh, in the Ministry of Energy, we're expanding uh, a number of uh, farms can't, uh, don't get access to gas, to be able to link them up to gas. So I think in the last uh, budget, I announced uh, phase three of that expansion. In my own community up in Oxbridge, that's a winner. That's the getting the gas connected into uh, into many of the farms. Uh, we're going to continue to support the agriculture sector from a technology point of view um, and, uh, and, and so that we can have scale and leadership. And I think more than ever, what we've seen over the last couple of years with COVID, with Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, how the food security and the critical uh, issues of supply, and we have it all right here in Ontario. And so supporting the sector is not just about supporting our communities, supporting good paying jobs, but it's also all about food security. And when you have all the resources and Ontario is so blessed and rich, it's an area that we're gonna to continue to support a thousand percent. And I know a thousand percent is not good math, but uh, <laughs> as your finance minister, give me, a, give me a pass there, please. So thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you.